Okay, welcome back. So what we're looking at here is the inverse of a square root function. So we're going to do the inverse of a couple of different functions, and we, through that you're going to learn how to take the inverse of any function. So here's an example, uh, the root of x minus 1. So I'm going to do the sketch of this, and I'm going to be pretty smart about how I do it. I know that the base curve of root x is at 0, 0, 1, 1, 4, 2, 9, 3. But I know that this is a transformation. This is a transformation to the right one unit. So instead of starting at 0, 0, I know it's going to start here. And instead of being at 1, 1, that point's going to move to here. And then that 4, 2 is going to actually be at 5, 2. So you're seeing how I'm using my knowledge of transformation of functions to do this fairly quickly. So 1, uh, sorry, 0, 1 and then this one is going to be 2 comma 1 and this one's going to be 5 comma 2 and so on and so on so because my base curve was moved uh, one unit to the right and I happen to know what the base curve is fairly accurately um, let's see what we want to do here so sketch the graph of f of x and its inverse well I've sketched f of x f of x is right there now the inverse is going to be reflected in the line y equals x so the line y equals x runs through 1, 1, and 2, 2, and 0, 0, and I can put that in here. There it is there, y equals x. It's that line, and then we're going to reflect this in that line. And that reflection, I know, is going to deal with, um, if I talk about it in terms of point notation, it's going to take x comma y to y comma x. So this zero, this 0, 1 point right there, if I label it down here, it's a little bit better, by 0, 1. What was I thinking? It's 1, 0. Sorry, guys. I had it right the first time. So that's 1, 0, 2, 1, 5, 2. And they're going to be reflected. So it's actually going to be 0, 1. So this point gets reflected over this line. 2, 1 gets reflected to 1, 2. So that's reflected over this line. 5, 2 gets reflected to 2, comma 5. And it looks like this. So there we go. So this is our inverse of f of x, and this is our f of x. And in this case, our f of x is root x minus 1. All right, so we've graphed them. Let's come up with an equation. So for f of x, we started with root x minus 1. So what we do is we interchange, not interchange, we rewrite it in terms of x's and y so that whoa I'm losing it today that is actually not there let's get rid of that oh that's not working let's see here there we go so we change the notation here from f of x to y we're now going to interchange the x and y's and now what we need to do is isolate for y. So this was interchange. That's the same as the domain becoming the range and the range becoming the domain. And now what we're going to do is we're going to isolate. We're going to isolate for y. So we're going to square both sides. That'll get rid of the square root. The square and the square root are opposite operations, so this is going to be x squared equals y minus 1. We're going to take the minus 1 over to the other side. I just rewrote how I had what on what side. And now I'm going to go back to notation. So this was isolating for y. And then this is simply notation. And this is the equation of this. Now, some of you should be looking at that and saying, hmm, this is a parabola. This is a parabola that has been moved up one. So it actually should have two sides to it, and it obviously doesn't, okay? Because the reflection of this 
original f of x only has one arm here. So now we've got to talk about something. We've got to talk about the domain and range of the original function. The original function has a domain of x such that x is greater than or equal to 1, and x is an element of the real numbers. And it has a range such that it's y, such that y must be greater than or equal to 0, and y is an element of the real numbers. That is the domain and range of this. Well, what happens is, if that's the domain and range of the original function, then let's take a look at the domain and range of our inverse function. It's obvious that our domain are all values of x, such that x is greater than or equal to 0. And our range has become y such that y is greater than or equal to 1. So what's happened is if you notice that our domain restrictions and our range restrictions for our original function have now changed places. Since we had a domain x greater than or equal to 1, we have a range down here of y greater than or equal to 1. I have a range up here of y being greater than or equal to 0, which gives me a domain down here of x being greater than or equal to 0. So this is another example of that domain range changeover. So the domain of my original function is the range of my inverse function. And the range of my original function is the domain of my new function. And in class, we've sort of seen that at the mapping notation. When I show you that you have a function f of x, and this is the domain of f, this is the range of f, and going the opposite way, this would be the inverse function, and this is, turns out to be the domain of the inverse function, and this turns out to be the range of the inverse function. Okay? So kind of interesting what's going on here. So because this guy had a restricted domain, this equation will have a restricted domain and range. The domain becomes the restricted range, which is x is greater than or equal to 0, which means this is, in fact, the equation for the inverse. The only thing you have to remember is it's going to have a restricted domain. It's only allowed to be for x greater than or equal to 0. So for all values of x greater than or equal to 0, we follow this equation and we get this graph. So if I was to put in 0, 0 squared plus 1 is 1. If I was to put in 1, 1 squared plus 1 is 2. If I put in 2, I get 2 squared is 4, plus 1 is 5. And there you go. And we're not allowed to put in any values of x that are less than or equal to 0 because this has a restricted domain and range. There you go. Kind of interesting. Let's try the next one. I've got a quadratic. x squared plus 2. Let's sketch it. Well, we know that the original function would be here, 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 4, but that original function is being shifted up too. So I can probably save myself some time. Instead of drawing the base function, I can go straight to, instead of 0, 0, it'll be 0, 2. Instead of 1, 1, it'll be 1, 3. Instead of 2, 4, it'll be 2, 6. So it's actually going to be here. This is the function f of x equals x squared plus 2. Now we want to sketch it in the same axis. It's got to be reflected in the line y equals x. So there's your line y equals x. 
we need to reflect it. So in, imagine taking the paper and folding it along this line. We'd see that would fold over like this. So the whole thing's going to come over. Um, we can do so by moving points if you want, just to make sure that we know what's going to happen. You know that the transformation is simply y comma x. So 0 comma 2 will become 2 comma 0. 1 comma 3 will become 3 comma 1. 2 comma 6 will become 6 comma 2. Negative 1 comma 3 will become 3 comma negative 1. And, and negative 2 comma 6, negative 2 comma 6, if I change these, will become 6 negative 2. And here is your inverse function. Now, something interesting. Oops, I don't know the equation for the inverse function. I can't write that in yet. Something interesting is the inverse function is actually not a function. You'll see that it fails the vertical line test. So that's a little thing that we're going to have to keep in mind here, is that when we reflected this x squared plus 2, it gave us the inverse, but it's actually not a function. So maybe I should just call this the inverse at the moment of this function. Let's determine an equation for this. Well, our original function is f of x equals x squared plus 2. We change the notation. We interchange the x and y variables. And we isolate for y. So we bring the 2 over to the other side. How do we get rid of a square root? A square? We square root. But we remember that when we square root something, it could be plus or minus, which is going to give us y equals plus or minus x minus 2. Okay, now if you're forgetful about why we include the x minus, let's recall that if I have something like x squared equals 9 and I square root both sides, I get x equals plus or minus 3 because minus 3 squared will give me 9 and plus 3 squared will give me 9. So don't forget about that plus or minus. So this was a notation change. All I changed was this. This was a domain and range change. So the domains became the range, the range became the domain, and this is an isolate for y. In other words, you're using algebra. Once we isolated for y, the very last step is simply to put it back into our notation of the inverse is going to be plus or minus the square root of x minus 2. Which, if we look over here, and we think about this plus or minus, we can think about this as two halves, as a positive x minus 2 square root, and a negative x minus 2. If we think about it that way, this makes perfect sense to us. And if we allowed x minus 2 to be our base function, what this really is is a negative on the outside of our base function. So if I make this be f of x, what this is is simply negative f of x. That negative is outside the function. It's a vertical reflection. It's a reflection in the x-axis. So this top arm is x minus 2, positive, from here to here. And this bottom arm is going to be the reflection of the top one over the x-axis. So that's kind of neat. Now again, it's not a function. Maybe you shouldn't call it a function. We're just going to call it an inverse at this point. So there you go. We have another example here for 181. I'm going to stop the video just in case I make a mistake and I don't have to start from the very beginning.